made a big mistake last week yeah um i have to i have to make a correction everybody for something i said last week because um i i think uh well nobody complained about it but uh i think my uh italian roots will turn on me the uh when we were talking about the uh, freddy de tomaso album i uh mentioned uh during the uh we were talking about the song di Cittancello vuia that it was written by uh um eduardo de capua and i mentioned that he wrote other great Italian or Neapolitan songs like Torna Sorrento, Return to Sorrento, but that's not his song. I made a mistake. I knew the name, but I just kind of was talking off the top of my head. Um, oh, I think I, wait, I messed it up. I'm sorry. Eduardo de Capo is the composer of Itevoria Vaza, not of Dicilentelvoria. Itevoria Vaza. I'm messing up all my composers now. This is terrible. All right, and he also wrote a very famous Italian song, which I said was Torna Sorrento, but Torna Sorrento was actually composed by Ernesto de Curtis, with words by his brother, Jean Battista de Curtis, so I, I messed that up. Uh, de Capua did indeed compose a song uh, that's really famous. In fact, it's the most famous Ita uh, Neapolitan song ever. What is it, Russ? Can you tell me? No. What's the only Neapolitan song you can, you think of when, when I say that word? Well, I know a few. I don't know what the most famous one is, though. I think you do. <laughs> it's it's start one that's taught it for me. Um, if I if I start singing it to you, you will uh, know it right away. Oh, well, just tell yeah. me. Yeah, it's O Sole Mio. Oh, okay. Well, everyone the most knows famous that one. Neapolitan song ever written, written by Eduardo de Capua. Not on that album, but I miss I misattributed uh, um, his name to another song that he didn't write, and I feel bad about it because I should know all this stuff. I used to know all this. I used to have it all cold. Wait, but I'm just you don't kinda... have a hit out on you from the family or anything? Let, let's hope not, day. yeah. yeah. <laughs> hope not. That, that uh, musical, that musical uh, family there, they can get, they can get very uh, protective. Yeah. I want to make sure credit is given where credit is due. Well. So, th so there you go. With that said, hello and welcome to episode 17 of Adult Music, the podcast with music for the mature mind. And I think we're going to start out, as we usually do, going back far enough, whereas if there are any historical inaccuracies, there will be no surviving known relatives that can seek vengeance on that. Yeah. And so let's start with the Baroque for this week. We we are safely not talking about Italian music this week. <laughs> yeah. So, so I can't mess it up. All right, but we will be talking about music that's uh, fairly well, well, very well known in some cases. Uh, and the first one, this is a really uh, big release, I think. Okay, this is the new album by the uh, violinist Augustine Hadelich. Uh He's recorded the Bach Sonatas and Partitas for solo violin. Now, I mentioned a few weeks ago that uh, we were going to talk about three solo uh, violin recordings, and this is the second of the three. The first one was of Ibrahim, Alina Ibrahimova's recording of the Paganini Capricci, the Caprices. And uh, here we have the Bach Sonatas and Partitas for Solo Violin, very famous work. Now, when I, um, you know, listen to, like, Ibrahimova play the uh, Paganini works, I had to kind of go reference another recording because I didn't know these very well and I needed something to kind of compare them against. Uh, this is not an issue for me um, with the uh, box and eyes and partitas because I think I have about 15 recordings of these works by 15 different violinists. I, I didn't count them, but there are a lot. Over the years, I've just uh, acquired like a new recording by every great modern violinist and one um, older one. Uh, the the first recording I ever had of this, and it's a it was a historical one even at the time, was by Nathan Milstein, and it's a, it's a really famous a Russian violinist. So I, I tend to have that as in in my head as a template for all of the other ones. Now to be honest, box music and baroque music in general um, is so wide open to interpretation because there really aren't any instructions in these scores, so that every recording it 
they're still playing the same notes and the same basic rhythms, but uh, they can sound like completely different works in a, in a sense, depending on how you pace them, depending on how you color the tones and how you, you know, kind of um, bring out the harmony. And uh, this this week we have um, so my favorite recording ever of this is by um, August is by uh, Nathan Milstein. Still, I mean, he's still the benchmark. Uh, there was a really good one a few years ago by um, a violinist who's not very well known, American violinist, and I can't remember her name. I will dig that up for you in a moment. But now we have this new uh, Augustine Hadelich recording, and I have to say, this might this is definitely my current favorite one. I really love this. I thought it was great. It's it's kind of new sounding. It's unique. It's a great recording and a fantastic performance. Um, he does the um, the uh, sonatas in the the works in order. Sonata one, partita one, sonata two, partita two. Sometimes other violinists mix them up, but I think it's really kind of important to put these in in this order because they, they kind of have a either I've just gotten so used to it that I kind of hear it as like a single sort of long um, you know sort of, um, I don't want to say composition, but um, sort of a progression to the end, uh, uh, you know, of all these, like, very, very, sh you know, fairly short works. Um, but uh, this one really has that kind of feeling. Um, okay, so the opening uh, in, in Sonata Number 1, the opening, the very famous, um, is it, I think it's a prelude, no, it's an adagio, the very famous adagio with its big... Uh, uh, chord at the beginning, which I believe is a G minor chord. Um, um, he, he you, in, in a way, the way you play this chord is going to kind of make a statement about how you're approaching this music because it's, it's just so famous. And um, he does this where he he draws this chord out, and plays every kind of note in it sort of individually and like a, you know, with a really slow sort of um, um, bowing. It's it's just he draws it out in this luscious honeyed tone it's like he's just pulling it out like it's taffy but it doesn't kind of get to the point where it's going to collapse you know it just feels uh sweet and the tone is sweet and sticky and it's like oh that's so good i really it was really a, a sensual pleasure to hear this and this is just the the first um five seconds of the work really okay and it goes on um it's it's fairly slow but the entire um adagio is, is played at this kind of with this kind of pace and this beautiful tone all the way through. Now, the next uh, movement is the uh, fugue, and uh, this fugue and the um, the fugue and violin sonata number two are the two that I kind of judge them by because I loved Milstein's uh, way with these, and uh, I, I love this too. The uh, lines connect really beautifully. Uh, fugues are really hard to play on the violin. You got a, you different melodies playing at the same time. Um, he had a good, uh, you know, sort of um, jumpy melody. And uh, the themes were all sharply outlined. Just fantastic. Okay, the slow movement is taken very slowly, like the Adagio. And the Siciliano, at the end, races. Now, um, the first um, partita, at about this point, we get into, okay, the first partita, which is four dance movements with uh, movements called double, or double, which is just sort of a variation on it. Okay, so it's sort of a rhythmic variation on the... Uh, on the dance, okay, is played rather. They're all played rather fast, and at about this point, I got a sense that there's like a wheels within wheels kind of quality to the way uh, Hadelich was shaping this entire performance. It's kind of like a Rubik's cube kind of thing, where this has to happen before this happens, and things like that. Where like one movement doesn't just lead to another, but there's like a, almost like a big structure to his approach. Um, uh, the other suites are kind of like put in contrast to. Uh, these suites and the recording. It's a deeply satisfying performance all the way through, and Hadelich's performance is felt throughout the performance. Now, I'm not going to go through every single, <laughs> you know, movement. We'd be here all day. These are, there are, um, let's see, of course, 32 tracks on this uh, double disc, this two hour and 18 minute, two hour, 11 minute, I think, or it's more than two hour recording. But of course, the centerpiece of the of these works is the great uh, Chacona, the sh Chacon. Uh, the set of uh, variations over the repeating bass line um, in violin partita number two. Now, as I was saying, all of the movements that we've heard so far in um, lead up to that one work, which is 14 minutes long, it's easily the longest um, in the um, in the um, the entire 
you know set of uh you know uh works and uh, a lot of ink has been spilled over this work on its deep spirituality and all of that sort of thing um for me um his performance of this chacon is it's really interesting it kind of he marks it off and he indicates like this is the center of this whole you know recording by playing the theme at full volume and brightness okay after like playing the previous uh, movements in fairly quietly and muted tone uh nothing else really sounded this loud on the album uh and uh that that theme comes back two times i believe two times i hope i counted right in the in the work while he kind of does all his other figuration and does these these variations with different sort of uh shadings of tone and uh you know muting certain passages while you know playing others out okay the alternation between shading and full-on sound keep your attention engaged so was the Chacon magical or spiritual? I can't really say. I was more drawn to the form, not to any kind of sense of transcendentalness in this. Um, I, so I didn't see God when he played this, but I enjoyed this immensely. I thought this was a great performance of the Chacon that everybody should hear. And I thought this whole recording was absolutely fantastic. The joyous violin sonata and partita number three in uh, C major and E major, respectively, just dispels all darkness from the piece and just leaves your, you know, your heart uh, in a good place. I have to say, during the uh, the entirety of this recording, there were just lots of little harmonic moments where he just will, with a slight um, retard or sort of like a, a way to, um, you know, or pulling out certain like, you know, discordant tones, it just made me smile. This This whole performance I thought was just life affirming it it gave me a good feeling and I want to recommend it if you're a big fan of this work and if you're a violinist especially give it a listen I loved this it's good it's going to be uh, listened to quite a bit I can tell yeah this is um, I think you lent me a recording uh, a few years ago of this repertoire uh, Giuliano Carminola yeah, Carmen, you'll, oh, there's, that reminds me. Um, there's one thing about this recording I want to say. Um, the way it's recorded, this is always interesting to me because a violin, is it's a small instrument, and you should be hearing it, I think, from a bit of a distance. But this is recorded very close up, so close, in fact, that at times, in certain works, but not in all of them, you can kind of hear like the the higher two strings in the right channel and the lower two strings on the left channel. And uh, that's that's really strange to me. Mm. And what reminded me of this is the Carmagnola recording is it has an oddity in it too. It's, I think it's recorded from the side. You don't get that effect, but you do get the effect of him moving from the right channel to the left um, because I, th I think he's probably moving around while he's playing. They probably had two mics set up, you know, these kind of ambient mics pointing in two different directions. And as he kind of twisted to get his expression right. out, you kind of heard that. It doesn't really affect you on a stereo, but if you're listening in headphones, you're kind of aware of it. Yeah, so. this... Um I'm, you know, solo violin is something that uh, for me, sorry, uh, all you violinists, but uh, I have kind of a limit on what I can usually listen to with it, as you could probably tell from my comments on some of the previous yeah. <laughs> recordings. But yeah. this recording, yeah. I thought uh, the timbre of this violin is really lovely. It's rich and sweet, and yeah. um, the, the dark tone he pulls out on the slower passages is really mm -hmm. uh, lovely. So I, I looked and then I, I noticed that on the album notes, they go into uh, making a point that he's using a Baroque bow mm -hmm. uh, here. And apparently, while not being a, a violin or string player myself, uh, I'm not really uh, sure of the details on the effect of this, but apparently it affects the sound and the technique quite a bit of using the down bow in, in Baroque music. And, uh, well, whatever effect that has and in how he incorporates it into his approach here, uh, especially on the slower numbers, it's really, really enchanting. And there's no harshness uh, to the sound at all. So I felt really drawn in more than I usually am on, you know, just listening to a solo violin with no real low end. The sort of um, fullness of the sound uh, makes it feel really complete to me. And uh, two hours, it's a, it's a lot to get through on one listen, I think, for anyone. But I made it through like the whole first hour having this on and, and, and enjoying the, you know, the 
the different approaches that you mentioned as he, right. he sort of he's not just thinking piece by piece he's really building this you know up giant and, uh, one unit structure sort yeah of. and yeah. um so I, I really enjoyed that and i i haven't heard a violin that sounds really this lovely uh in in a while so yeah i this is this is a really good journey through these pieces. I, I have a couple of recordings of this, and I've listened to some more, but I don't think I've enjoyed any of them quite as much as this one. So, yeah, even for uh, non, you know, solo violin fans, uh, if you need to get your Baroque fix or a Bach fan, this is definitely worth a listen. And probably for violinists and string players, this one can be really must hear. Highly recommended. Yeah, yeah you got to hear this. Yeah. Okay. So I found um, the the recent recording of this that I really loved was uh, from 2016 by Rachel Barton Pine. It was an album called Testament. She's an American violinist, and that was a really uh, compelling um, recording too. I listened to that one a lot as well. But I think right now, because this one's the newer one, I'm going to be like going to this one uh, quite often. I did hear the recent uh, Hilary Hahn one, which I also thought was great. But um, that's not a complete set. It's only three of them, and she recorded the other three when she was very young. So they're kind of not the same, not not the, not on the same uh, intellectual level. You know, they're a little different. Uh, I know I know there are a lot of Hilary Hahn fans out there. So you know, that, it was a good one though. It was just her gigantic tone. It really dominates those works, and um, I like that new album as well. But for a complete set, Rachel Barton Pine, uh, the famous uh, Deutsche Grammophone recording with Nathan Marilsbilstein, and now Augustine Hadelik for me um, is at the top of the heap. He's he's in the he's he's in the top. You know, right now this is the one that's obsessing me. So we'll have to see over time whether he stays there. But I think he might. Okay. Yeah, and this is on uh, Warner Classics. Warner Classics. Yes, that's it's got right. a lovely uh, album cover with our violinist. Um, kind of, you know, playing to the sunset here with these lovely clouds yeah. in the background and a beautiful blue sky, which we've been seeing here in Japan all week long. It's been fantastic. Yeah. And it's the rainy season. Uh, well, not all so week. So figure but, that yeah. out. Yeah, go figure. I don't know. So, yeah, there you go. Listen, Have, have a listen. This is, this is a really great recording. Um, incidentally, one of the things that makes this um, so appealing is really Bach. He's He offers enough variety. Um, I, I've listened to this. This week I broke it up when I was listening to this particular performance, but um, I've listened to these, um, you know, all the way through on many occasions. It's not difficult to do, you know, despite the fact that it's only a violin. Box music writing is so inventive, and uh, you know, added to that, uh, had a, had a lick some interpretation. It's it's uh, yeah, very appealing, uplifting, fantastic. Anyway, there you go. Our next um, offering for this week is another um, composer who's in the repertoire, and one that I don't really listen to all that much, um, but I like him enough. I when I kind of come across him, it's uh, Tchaikovsky, P Piotr Ilich Tchaikovsky, um, a recent recording by um, the Tonhalle Orchestra Zurich, uh, conducted by Pavel Yervi, and on the okay, Alpha the, label, yeah, on the Alpha label. This is um. The second um, in a series, I guess he's doing all six of the symphonies. This one features symphonies two and four. And um, I remember um, symphony four. I, I really have... Now, before I start talking about this, I have to give you a little bit of my history with these works. I'm very familiar with the uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth symphonies by Tchaikovsky because they were recorded in really famously by uh, Karyon, uh, Herbert von Karyon, back in the day when I was first discovering classical music. Now, these recordings, I don't remember what year it is, and I don't even have those recordings on CD anymore, I, <laughs> which is too bad, I guess, but I'm really more interested in, like, what's happening, you know, currently, you know, as, a, as opposed to in the in the past. Like, I like, I kind of, I don't know, I, I like to hear, you know, newer um, performances of this. So I sort of have, for the fourth, I sort of have the Carrion um, performance in my ear. Uh, symphonies uh, 1, 2, and 3 I'm less familiar with. I didn't give them the, you know, the um, the uh, intense listens that I did for the fourth, fifth, and sixth. Carrion really had a way of um, bringing these um, works to life. They have a lot of really catchy melodies in them. And um, the fourth in particular is, has, is, is really famous. The famous... Um, Pizzicato movement, the third, the third movement, the scherzo, and the last movement with the um, the uh, 
really fast uh, figuration on the uh, string section. Um, I remember, I remember hearing this. I think in a in a laundry commercial <laughs> a long time ago. So it's kind of in my head from popular culture. Oh, what they've done to this wonderful music! You know, you're associating it with your laundry now. Oh, it's just horrible. But uh, I can put that aside. <laughs> I listen. Okay, so this particular performance. What do I have to say about it? One, the thing that struck me um, right away was the first of all it's a great recording uh the, this it, it has an enormous presence uh, it really leaps out of the speakers um the um last week we talked about uh francois xavier rot uh his beethoven eroica and he mentioned that french orchestras tend to have they tend to pad the lower end of the orchestra to get more of a, a lower end sound out of the uh, of the orchestra, well, that seems to have been done here and to excess. I have to say, these uh, the lower end of this uh, orchestra really is really comes out, and uh, whenever there's like a percussion and uh, you know the bass and the cello is playing, it really booms out of the speakers. It's a uh, quite a dramatic effect. Now this works exceptionally well in the second symphony uh, in C minor, uh, sub you know uh, nicknamed the Little Russian, with its um, with its uh, themes, uh, its kind of Russian-sounding themes, um, it has a really visceral presence. Um, this this particular performance of the little Ru of the second symphony has uh, excellent momentum all the way through. I really liked it, and uh, has some um, fantastic. It has a fantastic ending. All the the tension of the buildup really pays off at the last sort of um, timpani yeah. roll and um, at the end. It's a pretty exciting performance. Uh, it, it really is going to depend on whether you like the sound of the of having a, such a heavy lower end or not. It's a pretty dark sound. Um, I liked what it enough. I, it was okay. What I like about this second symphony is um, it's different from a lot of other symphonies and even the fourth in that um, there's no great um, <clears throat> climax on the you know the uh, first through third movements. Yeah. They they all sort of end needing to be you know moving into the next movement naturally. So you don't mm -hmm. have any of these sort of uh, gradual climaxes. It's right. all sort of coming up to uh, the finale, which yeah. um, it, it it keeps it 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 forces you into um, expectation of what's coming next through there in this second symphony. So I really like that. Um, and um, and then the finale is a is a really great payoff here because you've got these huge timpani sounds and the the brass blend in this uh, orchestra is great and um, I I found the sonics on this um, kind of uh, intriguing because as you said the the overall recording is quite dark sounding but in a good way um, I, I I prefer that because I find it less fatiguing, especially on long orchestral works, and so the and, top and end is exciting and climaxes yeah, as well. It has enough clarity, even through all the registers, you can hear the string parts well enough. But the top end is subdued. But what I found curious about this uh, is that the overall sound level is quite low, and I found that I had to turn it up a lot higher on my volume to hear the clarity in the parts. Um, than I, I usually do on an orchestral work. Um, okay, I didn't find that to be the case on the CD. I was listening on CD. Okay, and, and, and it, it came through streaming, pretty loud. So yeah. could, it could be something in the um, uh, <clears throat> in that. I'm not sure, but um, yeah, I didn't find it. Uh, I actually liked that darker quality to it, um, and I found that it kept me engaged with it uh, through. The piece, and yeah, and, and I like how the, you're you sort of pulled through the movements on this, mm. and you have to get to the end of the Little Russian, and uh, yeah, I I know this piece. I have a few other recordings of it. What I liked particularly, I, I like uh, Yorvi's um, the way he handles tempos. They sound so under his control. There's nothing that ever sounds too fast. Uh, yeah. or too slow. It's, well, although I'm going to have something to say about that when we get to the fourth symphony. But anyway. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. here I found that, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just everything seems, uh, you know, just, you know, so well managed. You never feel like there could be, be anything that's sort of uh, getting out of control or, you know, going too fast. It just seems everything is perfectly in the pocket of tempo on, on uh, here. And uh, yeah, so I 
found this this second symphony a really fun yeah. performance and uh, it was exciting yeah fun to listen to on the recording yeah and a great payoff at the end this this big send off oh yeah all right now for, now for for me and I'm kind of like thinking of the Carrion recording against this sort of which I thought was really almost the, the Carrion recording um, th that I'm thinking of is a later one. Um, probably the later, the last one he did. I don't remember the year. I didn't look it up. But he, um, he he takes a few liberties with the score too. Like he he performs it in a way that no one else did. But it was very appealing. It was the first one I ever heard, so it kind of stuck in my head. And I felt like, um, you know, with that kind of in my head, the bottom heaviness of this recording didn't serve the fourth symphony, this symphony as well as it did the second. The lower end, and this, in at least in my listening uh threatened to um overpower the melodies on the higher end but it didn't okay you could always hear the um those melodies but there was always that kind of like sense that you know we weren't going to hear this um and i feel like cer certain um elements didn't register as a result um the, the 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 famous um opening of this with that kind of like ominous sort of horn the what is that a horn at the beginning the brat is it a it's a trumpet i think yeah, there's a whole the brass intro into yeah, the beginning here yeah. brass intro uh, it's, it's sort of ominous sounding and it kind of, it's, it's sort of, um, it, it didn't, it wasn't as compelling as it is in other performances. Now I had to compare it to another performance, um, recently I didn't go back to the Carrion, so I went to, um, Vasily Pat Petrenko's, uh, recent recording with, um, the Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra, um, recorded in 2015 and, uh, that's a really fine, uh, performance and uh, really taut, and uh, I just noticed that it had a lot more kind of um, energy to it than this this um, performance did. Um, this fourth symphony, the Yevgeny's fourth symphony, seems more episodic than of a piece. You'd have this, and then you move on to the next part, and then move on to well, the next part. Yeah, it compared to the second, to me, yeah, it, the the movements end like here. The first movement has this really big finish, and mm -hmm. so you you know you get these sort of climactic moments uh in the in the movements so it, it does feel sort of more broken up into episodes than the second was where it's pushing itself towards the end um yeah this may very well be his interpretation of the piece but it doesn't have to be like that and i prefer it when it, it, it kind of comes across as like a full sort of like you know more of a full arc you know throughout the whole movement as a you know maybe even the whole piece um the, I felt like the uh, performance felt sluggish at times, especially in the slow second movement. Um, the um, it, he took a, f a, a slightly slower tempo than most um, conductors take in the slow movement, and I felt like it, you know, like being on the bicycle and it's going slow, so it's going to tip over kind of feeling. I kind of was getting that losing from the momentum. second movement. Yeah, yeah, it kind of the first and second movements I felt kind of suffered a bit from this but things pick up in the third movement the famous pizzicato third movement works well with the bass strings adding a lot of presence okay so it's nice to hear that bum, 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 you know from the um the, the 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 lower end it really kind of made this you know gave it a new sort of um uh kind of feeling to me okay kind of a more visceral feeling and the racing string figuration in the fourth movement threatens to be swallowed up by the bass i felt because there i thought there was a bit of an imbalance here um the theme is the, those those racing strings, and I felt like they were just going to disappear into this giant gaping maw of the bra of the bass, <laughs> the strings. Hmm. Uh, he did he did manage an exciting ending though, just like in the second. Um, it it sends you off well, but I thought uh, I, I re-listened to the uh, Pet Petrenko recording from uh, the release in 2017, and I just found that to be far more satisfying. It was like it had a big rhythmic profile to it. He all the rhythms were really taut, and I felt like you know, it was it was just very exciting. Um, so I wasn't too happy with the fourth here, but I liked the second. So you know, on this recording, so I don't know. Give it a listen, see what you think. I would say. Yeah, I enjoyed both. I I like the the control he exerts, as I mentioned, and they're they're, they're kind of measured. Um, maybe you know too much, like you say, in the fourth compared to other performances. But uh, yeah, I didn't. Um, find anything that particularly bothered me uh, i've heard different interpretations of it um and uh yeah great i love the it is bottom heavy but i thought the when the brass comes in there's a lot of great brass in here which i'm always listening for and i yeah. thought that was well balanced from uh, top to bottom 
and um, the they said the sonics are a little unusual, but I I kind of like them, and because there was enough clarity in there, and mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, both I think it also depends on what good. Yeah. on what kind of stereo you're listening to it on too. You know, I'm kind of going by a lot of headphones and sort of a smaller, you know, house house stereo as well. Oh yeah, could be. Yeah. I was. So, I don't know. Yeah, I listened to this one on. Uh, well, both. I listened to this on headphones, and I had it on the big Dolly speakers too. So, um, hmm. I, I I enjoyed both. Yeah. What I, I what I the. I'll take anything a little bit darker rather than something that's too brash and then yeah. fatigues me. Um, yeah, especially now, they're on. getting older and the higher end of our hearing is going. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's but yeah, um, I, I like that. Uh, and, but like I said, there, there was enough clarity in there that I was enjoying picking out the you know, individual parts well enough. And um, yeah, yeah, no I'm, complaints from my from me on the. Uh, okay, I may recording. have to give it another listen and uh, see what happens. But I do recommend hearing the uh, Petrenko recording with the Royal Liverpool's. You yeah, know, I have that too. I think a really I, didn't, good one. I didn't have time to pull that out and compare it, but yeah, I, I thought that was really exciting. All right, now our last offering for tonight is a, uh, a relatively un well unknown composer, well, sir, unknown outside Unrecorded, of Bul yeah. Bulgaria. That's for sure. Um, well. He has been recorded, especially by one of my uh, favorite pianists, Mark Andre Amlan. But that, he's not the pianist on this recording. No, but a lot of no these one's ever made been a recorded, full album, hmm? right? I mean, a lot of these pieces haven't been recorded. Um, yeah, only individual works by him have been recorded, yeah. like one here, one there, and maybe a, only a handful, three of them or so. The um, composer is Pancho uh, Vladijarov. I hope I'm saying that correctly. I couldn't get a pronunciation of this. And it's um, performed by um, the uh, pianist with an equally <laughs> pronounceable name for us dopey Americans, uh, Nadezhda Vlaeva. I hope I said that right as yeah. well. Apologies if I didn't. And okay. to make matters even worse, it's on Hyperion. <laughs> so unless on you Hyperion. buy it, unless you yeah. buy it, you're not going to be able to hear it on any streaming services unless Idagio or one of the classical ones have. Uh, this uh, certainly not on Spotify, Apple, or, or Deezer. It's, it's not on Deezer, which we listen to. So yeah, you're gonna have to get the uh, the CD, or you can sample it on Hyperion's website, which I guess we'll put up. Um, but you can only hear about 30 seconds of each movement of each uh, work on that. Anyway, what is this composer like? Well, this, these are all piano works, and. Um, <laughs> I was trying to do some research on this composer, and uh, so I read the booklet notes, and this is uh, there's a booklet note by Francis Pott, who has written for uh, Gramophone Magazine, I believe. I seem to recall uh, his name in there, and it's a really complicated note. It really took you... Yeah, I, I feel like I can't summarize it because there's so many little details in it. A lot of it about music that isn't on this recording, but he wants oh. to give us a... <laughs> I think he wants to give us a, um, an overview of this uh, composer's... Uh, life and work, and also the very complicated history of Bulgaria. Uh, oh, boy, it's, it was really hard to follow. Not not because of the writer, but because of my feeble brain and the complications of uh, that time in history, which is the early 20th century. All right, anyway, Vladizirov was born in Zurich in Switzerland, but is Bulgarian and lived there. I'm not really sure why he was born in Zurich, but um, he has... What I would say about this composer from the recording and from what I read about him is that he has this kind of sense of bringing folk sort of um, traditions together, like in like combining them with um, a sort of Western sort of classical idiom, you know, kind of just putting the two together. And we hear a little bit of that um, on this recording. Um, the uh, there are two sets of works. They're all. They, oh, this is for solo piano, by the way. I should make. Sure, I want to make that clear. Um, there are two collections of works here. Uh, the first is the Six Exotic Preludes, Opus 17, composed, I believe, in 1924, and the Ten Impressions, Opus 9, um, recorded four years earlier in 1920. I should really check those dates. Oh, I'm correct. That is right. Okay. I remembered it right. Okay, so the six exotic preludes are the bigger works on this disc. Y you would think they wouldn't be, right, because they're called preludes, but no, these are... <laughs> These are pretty uh, heavy going works. Um, the first thing you'll notice if you listen to these uh, recordings is they sound really hard to play. I mean, this um, this is quite a yeah. quite a sterling uh, performance by the pianist Nadezhda Vlaeva. This is um, um yeah, this was you know, because this was a chance to hear something that I've never heard before. I, you know, I don't know any 
always exciting for both thing. of us. But yeah. what I found, like, th these works, I wrote, like, they're dreamy, they're impressionistic yeah. and romantic all at the same time. And that's because they're so dense. There's so many that's chords. That's the key word. I wrote yeah. dense, too. Yeah. And it's very colorful, um, and which made, it's so interesting. It's sort of like, um, I don't know, you know, it, it's like uh, a meal of, uh, you know, like right, steak we, and uh, yeah. and every kind of like high fat and protein food mixed together with like a really robust red wine. There's so much like hitting you at once. And but I think but there are a lot of you know subtle flavors in there. Oh yeah. You you said um, colorful. The word I used was perfumed because oh, okay. it, it kind of felt to me like 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 an artificial scent. You know what I mean? There, yeah. There's a lot of like different things. Like it's almost like wafting through the air, like like it's like a like a scent. The all this these different sounds. That's kind of how I kind of conceived of it. And just reading on what other people were writing about this, um, I picked up that most of these works, except for a couple, haven't been recorded before, which mm. made me think. You know, this is so interesting sounding. Why hasn't anyone recorded this before? And then the I second question, one reason, I yeah, would bet one reason is because they're so hard to play. Hard to play. The yeah. second thing is her playing is incredible. It's yeah. it's not only is it technically on, but it's it's not just that. It's really emotionally brilliant. She pulls yeah. out the subtleties in here, and only working from a score and not having unless you know not having any other recordings to like listen yeah. to and see what other people have done who have played this music. That's really amazing that she could interpret this music like this. But I found it really fascinating and fresh. Um, yeah, all these layers of um, yeah. you know, textures in these works, and she seems to like separate them uh, effectively. I mean, you don't really get a sense of like, yeah. well, of clutter. Well, you do, but not because of her. <laughs> Let's just say that. I'll get so, to that in a, in you soon. Know, the first time I listened to it, I just put it on as I was, you know, I think I was having some, you know, whiskey on the sofa, right. as I'm always doing in the evening. And it, it was just, I wasn't critically listening. I like to listen to something sort of in a relaxed nature first to get an overall impression. Mm -hmm. And um, then I like to listen to it again more critically. And so my first listen, and I think I shared this with you, when I was hearing some of the later more like um, sort of romantic kind of tracks, I, th I was thinking of sort of Russian romanticism with lots mm -hmm. of these minor keys and things like that. And so that's why I think the romantic sort of feeling came to me. And But the, when I listened to it again, my more critically, I was listening in the daytime. And then I picked up on more of this sort of, you know, I, I guess it's from the time period, but it's that impressionistic sort of almost a French quality of, you know, getting mm. these different tones and these sort of... Uh, little like uh, dreamy runs on it. And so, I, but I found both are in here. There's some, yeah. you know, sort of lightness and um, sort of like lith, lith, you know, beauty things. And then there's some really dense sort of uh, passionate, you know, minor kind of things in here too that are you know, really more emotionally ro you know, sort of romantic period things that you think and, but there's so much going on and it it changes there's lots of key changes and right. and then all these technical things she zips them all together like really coherently yeah and um yeah i really i mean you know, just my first impression i've only, i've listened to it like three times now but Right. This is I really was impressed by the performance yeah. yeah the performance is great and the material is uh yeah this is uh Really well, I, uh, nice for stuff. the material, I think it really depends on on your ear. I want to just kind of let me just explain a little bit of what he's doing in these uh, works. The, uh, the first of all, these six exotic preludes. I always love when a piece is called exotic. I'm like, whoa! But what, what he means by that is sort of um, music from other cultures, and in this case, it's cultures around the Mediterranean. So right. I guess uh, to him, yeah. so there's uh, different scales and things in here yeah. that he's uh, he's working right. Right, and it is, and that's a kind of key. The scales are what um, identifies the uh, nationality, not the rhythm. Okay, so the first piece um, is called the Nocturne Serenade, and it's it's a very Spanish sounding piece. It's it's specifically that, but you don't hear any sort of Spanish rhythms in it, like uh, bolero rhythms or anything like that. You you sort of just hear these this kind of like. Um, 
this melody that kind of it kind of it kind of reminded me of Albanese, really the um spanish mm. uh composer it's it's, it's very romantic it kind of made me uh think of that uh the second one is supposed to be bulgarian um in its um uh profile there's a lot of intricacy in the figuration uh not a subtle work highly virtuosic as you can, well as is all of it yeah uh, the third but we go back to there are three of these works that are spanish the third one um the exotic dance is also spanish um the it's got a staccato bass line at the beginning and i kind of that kind of put me in mind of the dancer's feet like this seemed like an exotic Ooh. spanish dance um again albanese came to mind um albanese he, he would be pronounced in spanish the fourth one is kind of arab it's got the uh the, the arab modes i guess in it which is kind right. of intriguing and like a romantic sounding work okay this is called an evening song it has chorale like chords i said they're chorale like it's not it's not a chorale but it kind of gave a a, sen a light sense of like spirituality or something like that as chorales will um solo configuration connects and comments on the chords the fifth one is the prelude is spanish again um okay very busy work and this the sixth um, one is slavic this one actually reminded me of ravel though there's a very famous yes. ravel piano piece called the la vallée de cloche uh the valley of the, the city of bells where he's doing all these different like kind of bell sounds on the piano it's just so beautiful i just love it and this one has something like that um these chiming sort of um repeated notes that kind of give you give a bell-like quality so the exotic pro they're pretty heavy going i have to say i f i felt that the um the romanticism in this music you, you, you know you can listen to it and say oh it's it combines all these forms it's really great but it's dense and sort of overripe and if you really don't like this kind of like you know kind of like things all kind of put together like this um this is going to be kind of a rough going for you yeah. I, I hope I, I hope we impact unpacked it enough to you'll yeah. enjoy it a little it's more not sparse like foray yeah. or something there's, there's like no that. space no, in this like, uh, it can feel really claustrophobic yeah yeah, yeah i was kind of like is there any there's no space in this music and you had mentioned something about the recording um, well to me. yeah i wanted to get to that um, well, let's get to that later. Let's just talk about the impressions because okay. I don't really have too much to say about these. They're a little earlier and they're harder to describe too because they don't really have any kind of like national profile like the preludes do. Yeah, we almost kind have of, preferred to heard these before the yeah. other ones, um, just yeah. in the impact that they had. But yeah, they're shorter and they're um, yeah they're they're kind of a little more. Um, the, what they're kind of trying to convey doesn't really come across. They all have these titles like Desire, Embrace, Waltz Capriccio, etc. But uh, they don't seem to um, evoke those. Not as much, no. The, yeah, they don't. They don't really seem to evoke those um, feelings that they're named after. I, I thought that was really yeah. odd. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there are some kind of interesting scales in these. I, I, I don't think I'm going to go through these like one by one because I just had again they're called 10 impressions and I only had impressions of them you should probably just hear them yeah. um, number two for example the embrace it's called embrace and it kind of has this ballroom dance like kind of quality to it mm -hmm. so that would be the embrace you're dancing with your partner um, the waltz capriccio is kind of reminiscent of those late 20th century waltzes like by Sharwenka and Moskovsky and people like that they're kind of like Chopin with more piled on it sort of Okay. Then there's a piece called Caress, which is a light salon piece. Elegance has cascading scales, which I guess would indicate the elegance. Um, um, I, I wrote that a lot of these are Chopin-esque, and then the later ones, like um, Passion and Surprise and Resignation, sort of reminded me of Late List. They're mm. a little sparse. They're fairly quiet. Um, there are a lot of withheld cadences in them, and that's the sort of thing that List and Wagner did. You know, they brought to its breaking point, really, as did uh, Mahler later on, the last great romantic composer. So um, worth hearing, but a little harder to pin down, I'd say, these ten impressions. Uh, the exotic preludes were the thing that kind of drew me. Yeah, those okay. are definitely... Um, mm. you, you could just have... Those as a set, I would have been satisfied with those. Uh, I didn't dislike the uh, the impressions, but it yeah, yeah. didn't uh, intrigue me as much as the preludes. Right? I, yeah, I was. I think I was kind of like satisfied by the uh, yeah the preludes, and then the impressions came along. I was kind of like, yeah, it's, you know, it wasn't really um, yeah, maybe they, if they had come first, if I had heard them first, yeah. yeah. 
All right. Well, do you want to say something about the sound? Because I kind of thought of some, I was I listened to it again after you had said that. I have something that I, I'm wondering yeah. about well, this. Actually, to me, I guess I, maybe I overuse this word, but it's the recording is uh, kind of veiled to me. And uh, what, by what that what I mean is when I hear this, I feel like that the the piano is in, almost in another room. I feel that I, it's there's a wall or you know, some sort of uh, deflection between the full sound of the piano and uh, what I'm getting. And um, it's not, it's kind of different from other Hyperion recordings uh, that I've heard. And that, that bothers me some, especially in the, uh, you know, the preludes, I was really getting into listening to them. But I, I felt that I wasn't getting the full sort of uh, tonal palette of the piano and the uh, dynamic impact of it and but i couldn't just uh, you know sort of ascribe it to um the position of the microphone being far away or something but i i didn't uh i, I just feel like there's something missing in the presence of the piano in the recording uh, and i've well, listened to it on a few different on two different systems and with uh headphones also and i still feel the same way about it well I, I was listening to this and I was thinking, I don't think it's the recording. I think it's the music because it's so, but here's the, here's why. Cause I've heard, I've heard a lot of like, this kind of reminded me a little bit of, um, Max, not Max Weber. Yeah. Ve, what, not Weber. Who is it? Who am I thinking of? Oh, I can't remember now. Anyway, some German composer, Max Rieger. That's who it was. Um, mm. uh, his, his music. It just seems really like, just like clotted and so, you know, with, uh, tones that you can't really get any sense of the harmonics kind of ringing out of the piano. They're all sort of being like reinforced by some other thing that the pianist is playing. So right. you don't really get that kind of high end sort of like, you know, sort of like ringing sort of sound. I, I thought it was just the busyness of the uh, the writing, the, the density of the writing that might have taken away from the sound. Because I feel like I've heard the same sort of thing on a Rieger um, performances as well. It's possible. What do you think? I mean, mm. you know, what I felt like is... Um, because I'm sitting on my sofa listening to this, or <laughs> I'm, I'm up, you know, up where I am now with my headphones on, and I can't do. It doesn't matter what I do, but what I felt mm. like the I want to move my seat. It's like oh, I mean, I've got a bad seat in the auditorium. I want to, you know, find that sweet spot a little bit more right. because I'm not getting the, you know, the full, you know, tonal spectrum coming out of this piano, uh, or I feel like I'm standing just outside the door of the hall. And now yeah. I want to go in and get all of it. I just felt like uh, something was being held back for me in the recording of uh, yeah. Yeah, this, you know, in the sound quality, yeah, uh, I know what which you is mean. a shame yeah. because I really love, you know, I I like this music and especially for something I've never heard before. It was intriguing, but it was intriguing. I don't know how many times I'm going to listen to this though. It was kind of, you know, it, it's not. It's a. It's. It was wearying because there was so much happening, yeah. you know, in this music, yeah. you know, it was kind of, I was sort of yeah. like, oh man, this is really, <laughs> it's this is like really a, a lot to take on. A piano survival kit or something, you know, it's yeah, like, well, oh, it is, yeah, it yeah. is appealing though. I don't yeah. want to like put people off. Like I mean, a nutrition it's, bar or something. It's got all, yeah. it's, got, <laughs> it's all, got all the vitamins you need for the whole day, for the whole all journey. at once. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it's like yeah, eating three I, meals at once. I like that <laughs> quality about it. Yeah. It's got enough for, it's got enough for the whole rest of the album, right? In the, in the preludes there. Right. Um, okay. That's it. Just six minutes done. Yeah. <laughs> that's but the whole yeah, album. Yeah. I hope, yeah. you know, I'd like to hear some other people tackle this now too. Um, yeah. And see what else they can well, pull out of it. And, yeah. Some know. other works too. I'd like to, you know, I'd like to hear some more of this, this yeah, uh, composer's yeah, for works. Sure. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he he definitely has some really interesting ideas and and beauty going on there. So, yeah. And there we go. That's the that's your classical music for episode seventeen. Onward then, <clears throat> yeah. to jazz. And well, we've got a mix of things today. Uh, starting off with a Russian-born saxophonist, Dmitry Baevsky. Ah. And his new recording called Soundtrack. And this is on the Fresh Sound New Talent label. And I take this as to be a sort of soundtrack of his uh, recent life in uh, New York and other places. And uh, 
Well, it seems he's moved on, actually, though. But uh, Bayevsky is from uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, and he started piano at a young age. And uh, later, as a teenager, he picked up a saxophone. Apparently, he had a uh, grandfather uh, who was uh, a famous uh, Jewish ethnomusicologist and uh, gathering melodies and uh, words of Yiddish folk songs and other Eastern European Jewish dance melodies and klezmer music. And uh, he uh, studied at the Mussorgsky College of Music in Russia. And uh, then uh, he arrived in New York at age of 19, very young, went to the New School University on a full scholarship. And uh, then he was very soon uh, working in New York and the jazz scene. And he's played with uh, such people as uh, Benny Green, David Hazeltine, uh, Peter Bernstein, Cedar Walton, and lots of other big names. Uh, about a few years ago, he, uh, 2016, he uh, jumped ship and went to Paris, and uh, but he still keeps a connection to uh, New York, and I think this album was actually recorded in uh, New Jersey. And, well, it's uh, an interesting recording, and uh, what I really liked is um, Bayevsky is uh, a player who likes to mine the old traditions uh, against what we usually hear uh, these days in new jazz. And uh, so he's going back to the uh, swing, bop uh, kind of uh, time and post-bop and uh, picking up, you know, some older styles and finding new things that he can do with them. And so I found this uh, really uh, interesting recording. And let's see, who does he have here on uh, his uh, recording? I have it copied down here, but it's uh, not right in front of me. Anyway, I'll go through the, uh, the can't, tunes Can't here. help you with that, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, I know. I copied <laughs> down. Oh, here we have it. Yeah, so the, the okay. rounds out, it's, uh, yeah, he's on, uh, no, he's on alto uh, sax, Dmitry Bayevsky, uh, Jeb Patton on piano, uh, David Wong on bass and Peter Van Nostrand on drums. And um, so this is a very interesting mix of material. Uh, we've got uh, starting out with a tune called Evening Song, which also has a, a Russian uh, title. So this is a composition by Vasily Solovyov Sedoy. So it's a Russian melody and that uh, starts out uh, on just piano, it's kind of haunting melody, but then it turns to swing and the sax comes in and you get a uh, really good taste of Bayevsky's uh, unique sound here. Um, it's a very uh, thick but soft tone and he has a soft attack also. And um, he comes in and with this really nice solo that's uh, relaxed but swinging and uh and then he he gets into some kind of 16th note runs uh, towards the end and uh you, you can see that uh he has a great technique but he's not a show off uh and he he really plays this with a you know real swing feel uh that's most important uh in in the way that he's going to improvise uh and then the next track is uh Vamos Nessa by uh, Juan Donato. And uh, so here we're into a um, Brazilian kind of uh, bossa nova, but it's very uh, funky uh, with a very intense repeated chord uh, opening. A nice sax solo here uh, that shows some more intensity. And then he does some outside of the chords uh, playing here. And this is where I started to pick up that uh, the pianist on this album is really... Uh, got a lot to offer uh, for each style and each sort of, you know, time period they cover. He matches that atmosphere perfectly. And he's got some really funky lines and nice open chords. Uh, number three on the disc, uh, let's see if I can pronounce this, Bautiskaya. Uh, it's also got a the uh, Russian script for it. This is his original tune. It's like a bluesy swing kind of tune. And uh, the the style on this tune and his sound really go back uh, to uh, 
uh, you know, an earlier kind of 50s jazz period. And the sound of his sax matches that perfectly. And the piano sort of, he adjusts, you know, his style to each tune. And here is no uh, exception. That sounds great. There's a lot of tracks on this album. Uh, 13 tracks, actually. Mm. Uh, more four, than usual. Mm. Yeah, more than usual. We've got uh, Grand Street by Sonny Rollins. And uh, this is perfect for him. Uh, and he does... Uh, in you know, a nice kind of Sonny Rollins uh, style here, a nice bluesy piano solo, and then uh, he speeds it up on the uh, sax with, uh, and uh, you know, in the solo. And there's also a, a really thick sounding bass solo. The bass uh, comes out here. And I thought this is a, a really nice uh, working group. They have a really good uh, synergy and communication. Uh, and then, uh, he gives us another different taste here. We've got the Jody Grind uh, horse silver tune. And then, of course, you can say, oh, funky, as soon as this yeah. starts. Uh, yeah, it's a great horse silver tune. It's got a really awesome bass line. And then, uh, yeah, the pianist here, he comes in with that real, you know, silvery piano yeah. kind of solo. Um, he's uh, you know, it was, it was a little long. It was really appealing. I liked yeah. this track a lot. And, uh, mm. and Bajewski's uh, sax solo has got a lot of double time lines that show his technique uh, really well. And there's a little uh, nice uh, drum breakdown uh, beat solo uh, that captures that funky groove. So that was really nice. And uh, then we've got uh, a, a tune, uh, La Chanson de Massens, I think it's pronounced, uh, Michel I Legrand. Guess. Yeah. And uh, this is a nice mid tempo swing, it was a really beautiful melody. And uh, nice swinging sax solo, and uh, he he shows some great articulation here in the accents and his lines. Uh, nice swinging piano solo, and then um, when after the uh, solos, when the melody comes back the last time uh, after the solo, it's I think it's repeated twice, and then uh, it's rubato on the sax, and it's got a nice uh, a bowed bass accompaniment to it <laughs> and so it, it really lulls yeah. you into this feeling and you think oh we're just going to have a lullaby to the end and then suddenly no it it's, it goes <laughs> into an even more bouncy swing outro and i thought that was a really nice touch on the arrangement uh here a surprise ending on this tune um then um we get a, a another original tune called over and out and this is a really cool like uh, bebop original by Bajewski. Uh and it's got some really interesting intervals in the melody line and then his solo on this is a really great technical display um, <clears throat> he incorporates these intervals into the solo but it's so smooth and composed uh, you know in the bebop idiom kind of here that it's great and uh, the piano matches uh, the you know that overall um, style here well and then um, when the melody returns, they sort of trade off this that um, interval line from the melody with uh, drum soloing. So uh, that was really a cool, um, you know, original bebop style tune, which you don't get to hear something new like that so often. Uh, number eight, uh, Le Coiffeur, uh Dexter Gordon tune. And this has got a little kind of a cha-cha beat here. And uh, it's it's a really cool tune. Uh, it's a light and airy melody with some stop time phrases at the end of the uh, verses for contrast. And uh, the the piano solo here is really tasty. Patton is a really tasty player. Um, and then uh, the sax solo has a lot of effortless kind of uh, flowing sixteenth note figures here. It's a really nice number. And then uh, another surprise. He's got an Ornette Coleman tune here. Um, called uh, Invisible. And this has got a lot of really challenging chord changes uh, in this tune, but he makes it sound uh, really effortless. Uh, he starts out uh, this kind of really weaving solo, and he makes like easy work of uh, this, because you, you by now you'll see that he's such a great improviser that his melodies are really logical. Uh, whatever he plays, when you hear his solo, it's like a composition. It's like, oh, it couldn't have been any other way. Uh, it's it's really uh, well put together solos and a nice driving piano solo uh, here. Really listen to the left hand on here. Uh, it, it it's really uh, a, a nice piano solo. And then uh, going out, we've got some trading fours uh, with the sax, piano, and drums. Uh, then we've got uh, 
the the uh, lush ballad treatment of uh, autumn in new york the well-known standard um we get some nice uh, relaxed sax and piano solos but uh, Bayevsky comes back in after the piano after the piano solo and then he heats it up with some more intense fast runs before he slows it down again for the final melody so he puts a little kind of hot sauce on the uh, the uh, slow <laughs> number which was a little bit nice um then we've got uh Stranger in Paradise, another kind of well-known melody, which gets a mid uh, mid-tempo string treat, uh, swing treatment, and right. uh, but uh, against that as a really fleet sax solo, uh, and he changes it up in the solo. It's a nice contrast of uh, fast and slow lines uh, within, you know, one performance that I thought was nice. That's um, track eleven. There's still two tracks yeah, left. Two more to go. <laughs> uh, Twelve. Uh, Ahmad Jamal, Tranquility. And uh, this is a, an interesting yeah, Horace Hor Silver's pal. That's great. Yeah. With, uh, Together again. Some contrasting sections of rhythm. Uh, but then it sort of settles into a, it's intense but not fast swing with a really ringing uh, kind of piano solo. Uh, it's got these like fast lines but then chiming chords. And then uh, Bayevsky, his his tone is like normally like really, it's, it's this kind of you know soft, uh, dark and full tone. But on this piece, he he kind of uh, makes a harsher tone to build some tension at the end uh, compared to the other tunes. So that was a little bit of a change of pace here. And then we've got uh, the the final tune uh, in contrast to Autumn in New York. We've got Afternoon in Paris. Yeah. And uh, what was interesting here, uh, because uh, this is a pianoless tune, uh, so just sax, drums, and bass. So uh, it's kind of a loping swing tune, and uh, the sax starts it out, and then the bass uh, comes in for a solo after the bass is with the sax at the beginning. And uh, without the piano, of course, you get a different kind of harmonic openness. And it was a surprise after all the great piano on this album, but uh, yeah, uh, enjoyable change of pace. And so I thought this was a really uh, nice release. Uh, I haven't heard Bayevsky's playing before, but uh, I really like that they're uh, going back and mining these sort of earlier styles of jazz. Uh, but everything still sounds really fresh. Uh, we got, uh, you know, great technique all around, especially on the sax and piano. Uh, the solos are uh, all you know, well-crafted, with lo full of lots of ideas, and the interplay between all of the players is top-notch. And then you've got Bayevsky's uh, very distinct sound uh, is very identifiable, I think. And so anyone who likes uh, bebop and earlier kind of post-bop music, I think, would be intrigued by this uh, release. Yeah, it's a really easy listen. He's got a beautiful mellow tone, too, really easy to listen to, easy on the ear. Um, I Yeah, I... I uh, <laughs> today, today I was listening to this today. It was a nice sunny day. It was just really yeah. perfect. It had it had me in a in a good place. I really enjoyed him. We'd like to hear more. Yeah, I, he's got you know he's really in, internalized this uh, his uh, swing concept. I felt so. Uh, he always sounds so relaxed. Uh, you know, and even when he's playing really fast, right. it's like yeah, it it's always like right there uh, in the groove. And uh, and I like this because. Yeah, I'm listening to a lot of other, uh, you know, new releases that are really, you know, pushing sort of the grounds of, um, you know, where jazz is. And a lot of times that doesn't include swinging, you know, but this music all really uh, swings and uh, the the uh, familiar rhythm uh, sort of emphasis is right here, but effortlessly so. And so, uh, yeah just really enjoyable so definitely worth uh, checking this one out all 13 tracks of it yep enjoyable and uh, after that get away you're too close too close for comfort oh they that's, that's what the ladies always say to me that's what they say oh you're doing something <laughs> wrong then they don't say get over here big boy yeah. <laughs> anyway too close for comfort on high note labeled by the great pianist George Cables. And uh, I came to know George Cables as, uh, you know, an accompanist uh, 
a, a sideman on most of great recordings in the past, especially he was the preferred accompanist of uh, Art Pepper. Uh, and they did uh, several recordings uh, with just piano and sax um, together. Uh, and so I knew him from those days. And apparently in uh, recent times, he had some health problems and uh, almost uh, checked out of uh, this world. But uh, he's recovered and recorded uh, a number of recordings in recent years uh, as a leader. And uh, he is such a fine player. Everything he plays is a joy to listen to. And, you know, when you listen to uh, him play, you're not expecting some great innovation. You're just uh, going to hear, you know, some of the finest uh, playing in the modern jazz idiom and uh, incredible treatment of s songs uh, that, you know, just make it for an enjoyable listen. And that's exactly what you get here, uh, joined by the great Victor Lewis on drums. And then uh, we have a Nigerian-born bassist, uh, Esia Okon Esia. And that's his name. And he's a nice yeah. bassist. Um, and this uh, recording is a mix of some well-known tunes and also some originals by Mr. Cables. So, uh, yeah, uh, kind of a nice combination. It starts with the title track, Too Close for Comfort. Uh, you get that sort of anxious uh, beginning that fits the you know, title, some tension there. And... Uh, get some really nice left hand chords that push the melody and give an added syncopation at the end of the verse which is nice you get a really jubilant uh, piano solo and a nice bass solo to set the mood of the album and then the next track is an original called a uh, circle of love and uh, it's a fun tune with uh, nice chord changes in the six eight uh, kind of rhythm feel a very nice piano work in both hands uh, and a tight bass so and I started to notice that on this album uh, you know he's a player if you listen to him carefully uh, his hands do some amazing things uh, together mm -hmm. he can sort of switch up what his left hand is doing from you know just uh, you know an expected accompaniment to like working together with what his right hand is doing and uh, I enjoy that a lot yeah, he's a pretty compelling pianist all around. I really like his sound. It's kind yeah. of like, kind of, it's got like a sort of roughness around the edges. You know, it's like, yeah, kind of, and it, it kind of makes all those um, harmonies that he's playing stand out. You know, you can kind of, yeah. you can hear all the, uh, the the sort of, I don't know, what would be the word be counterpoint, just harmony, just whatever yeah. he's playing against. To, yeah, I, I liked it a lot. He, and the he the a recording lot of, helps a lot too. It's really excitement, good. Excitement uh, in his lines. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, number three is also uh, an original tune. It's called "This Is My Song." I guess it's a good title if you make your own song. And uh, <laughs> it's a nice, even uh, samba-like beat and bass line. And uh, he, he has a here. You get a, a sense of his uh, you know piano touch. Uh, very nice touch on the searching melody uh, yeah. throughout here. Um, yeah, he, he has, uh, especially on ballads, he can really, you know, get a really good uh, tone from that, you know, nice right hand touch he has. Uh, four is uh, another original, uh, Klimo, I think it's K L I M O. Uh, it's a intro kind of alternating vamp that uh, builds tension, and then uh, this alternates with melody phrases. You get a, a really nice agile piano solo with an always tight. Uh, left hand until it brings back the vamp and uh, kind of a fun original tune. Uh, five, a well-known tune for all we know uh, with a solo piano opening and then the bass enters for a nice uh, relaxed ballad treatment. Uh, really Cable shines here. Uh, he pulls out this really lovely tone and uh, he's got some really elegantly placed attacks uh, that are never too soon like just enough hesitation um, that uh, show a nice stylizing of this tune. Uh, it's a really beautiful track. It's kind of, it, it's a, little, a lot different in tone than the rest yeah, of the album. the tone and, is different. Uh, and it's sort of the centerpiece too. I think this is, uh, yeah, there are 10 tracks yeah. on this album. This is number five. Yeah, I yeah, wrote. Really beautiful then, change of pace. Yeah, the, the mellow <laughs> bass solo is really appropriate. And I wrote, you know, this is what Cables can bring magic to uh, with mm -hmm. his uh, 
mellow touch uh, here. Um, so this was really good. Uh, next, we've got a tune called Crazy Love. And this is by the Japanese pianist uh, uh, Tarataka Unno. And uh, this is kind of a fun tune. It's really nice, tight harmony with some dissonance in 6-8. Uh, the rhythm and bass is uh, in, the, in the left hand is uh, really nice here. The drums add some muted rhythms. Um, uh, there's no bass here. And then kind of like you get this feeling of like a crazy uh, love affair uh, that sort of matches the the uh, title to it. Um, so uh, it's a, a nice uh, cover of this tune. Uh, number seven, here is Roses Poses uh, by Bobby Hutcherson. And uh, it's got a nice um, opening vamp in a samba beat. And uh, he keeps the tension up with his left hand uh, throughout the piece. And, uh, you know, Bobby Hutcherson, a tune, you, you can imagine on his solo that it's, it could be like a vibraphone playing these lines. Uh, you know, you can see like a couple of mallets being able to uh, play the way he voices these. Uh, and then uh, a nice bass solo and uh, back to the piano and uh, nice drumming accents here too. So this is kind of a fun tune. Um, number eight, I've never been in love before. Uh, starts out with some nice syncopated opening chords into a, a swing feel. And uh, he plays the, Cable plays the melody uh, really lightly. And then the opening figure returns. And then it, it goes on in this pattern of the melody and then this opening figure coming back. And then you're into a really fun solo. And I really like how his hands work together and then stagger with each other uh, with real ease. It's like he can switch up what he's doing uh, with the type of uh, left-hand accompaniment here. And uh, so this is a nice track. Uh, number nine, another uh, Bobby Hutcherson tune called Teddy. And got a nice Latin opening with uh, interesting drumming. Uh, the intro to the melody is, uh, and then you go into the melody, it's got kind of a Latin beat on cymbals and the Latin figure from the opening returns. An another piece that shows off his uh, interplay with uh, two hands, uh, and sometimes they double together uh, what his ideas are. So he, he gets this idea in the, in the left hand, just sort of joins the right hand to complete these ideas, which is really cool. And the bass solo has got some really nice uh, latin -y figures uh, here. And then uh, the album finishes up with a really short original, that's nice. It's called a Valentine for you. And this is just a beautiful short solo piano piece. And this kind of reminds me of uh, some of the things I heard him do with uh, Art Pepper in the past uh, that had no drums or bass. And so, yeah, what you get here is uh, it, there's nothing, you know, we wouldn't call this an innovative recording, but you've got a real master of the mainstream piano and he's doing uh, what he does best with really great uh technique, emotion, and taste. So if you like jazz piano, you can't go wrong with uh, this or any of the other recent releases by George Cables. Yeah, he's he's a pretty identifiable pianist by his sound. It's, he doesn't really sound like anybody else. I notice it's that, it's that kind of like, uh, you know, that, that's sort of a, you know, slight roughness around, you know, the edges of yeah. the sound so that it all kind of comes together. Also, I, I, this album is just a really nice, breezy kind of record to listen to. I kind of, yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed it. It, it, it. You know, we, we had a lot of sun here in Japan, where right. we live in Japan this week. And, uh, it just, it just kind of suited the mood. Well, I just kind of, yeah, I really enjoyed this. It, 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 all the elements, uh, conspired for me to, um, really enjoy this record. Yeah, Although it, I would have anyway, I'm sure. It's got that, it's got that right mix of, you know, mm. ballads, swing and Latin so that, you know, he moves you through, you know, the nice mix and then yeah. also original, his original tunes, which are nice and then familiar things. So it's, it's a really nice journey and, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, check it out. Uh, as a player I've listened to for a long time and I'm happy to see him still making great new original music. Uh, you know, especially after his, uh, health problems and recovery. So I hope he keeps recording some new stuff and we got one more and yeah. uh this 
is uh, something I've been looking forward to for a and long time. And it was time. worth waiting for, let me tell you. It was worth waiting for, that's right. And this is the latest recording by, well, pianist and organist and uh, equally great on both. The fabulous Mike Ladon. Although he's playing organ on this recording this all is, the way through, this, right? This mm -hmm. album is all organ, which he's been focusing on uh, a lot, although his uh, previous release was piano. But uh, in recent years, uh, he's done a lot of recording on organ with the Groover Quartet. And this one is on uh, the Savant label, and it's called It's All Your Fault. It's not my fault. <laughs> it's somebody's fault. I don't know. Um, actually, we know who's we know whose fault, fault it, is. it is. That's right. Um, because <laughs> we'll tell you why later. Uh, oh, you want to because, tell them now? Well, yeah, we can. We can okay. tell them. Uh, well, we can tell them a little bit. Uh, we found out whose fault it was because uh, we were lucky enough to have a nice talk with an interview with Mike Ladon, and uh, he told us uh, all about this recording and lots of other good information, and uh, so much so that uh, we're going to have it as a separate uh, standalone interview episode, and um, yeah. we're going to release that later in the week. Uh, we'll put right. it out on Friday morning, our time. So that's going to be Thursday for Americans. Thursday, Thursday evening. Thursday yeah. evening, American for Americans. Time. And everybody else, it'll be Friday morning. For everyone else, it'll be Friday. And you're going to mm. want to hear that. Um, yeah, really interesting. Because uh, I'm yeah, still thinking about it, actually. I'm still thinking about all the things he said, too. Yeah. Mm. Um, but that's, I don't want to give uh, too much of it away here. <laughs> no, that's coming up. So we're going to talk about uh, uh, what we got out of this uh, recording. Uh, but if you really want to hear uh, the inside, right from the source from the fabulous Mike Ladon himself uh, stay tuned and check for that Friday release uh, for this so uh, what we've got is uh, now the organ. key point about yeah the key point about this record is the big band right yeah that's right yeah. because uh, mm -hmm. he's been working with the Groover uh, quartet for many many years uh, with you know, the fabulous Eric Alexander on sax and um, you know the, his other regular uh, players uh, from the quartet uh, Joe Farnsworth on drums uh, Peter Bernstein on guitar uh, John Weber on bass but now he's got this uh, full big band uh, with a whole host of players uh, you know uh, John Faddis on trumpet uh, Steve Davis on trombone and uh, this is all, all arranged and uh, conducted by uh, Dennis Mackerel uh, and it's really great how the big band you know just fits in with his uh, quartet format uh, adding you know just the right steam to uh, these great tunes and it's a really uh, interesting mix of tunes um, so uh, let's go through what we've got here on the tracks uh, the first one is the title track an original by Michael mm -hmm. Don it's all your fault and if you want to find out whose fault it is as we said you got to check out that interview um, but this is bringing things off to a real screaming start with the horns uh, and once you get in there's a organ vamp uh, that sets the tune and then the horn lines uh, you know, they back up this really uh, funky organ solo over the vamp but then when the horns come in they push the organ solo into to the, a new groove that's a real swing groove uh, you know great tenor sax solo here uh, some groovy organ comping and uh, Peter Bernstein comes in with a really you know fluid guitar solo like he's known and then what's great here because uh, the Groover Quartet is always great, but, you know, when you come on the repeats on the solos, the horn lines just feed that, uh, you know, climax of those things. So, uh, in, yeah, I just want to say now, the all the solos on this record just really well. Oh, yeah, 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 the, really, uh, it's, it's just fantastic. Really this is such a high energy, uh, sw hard swinging album. It's just fantastic. Really, uh, yeah. yeah, it'll yeah. brighten your rainy day in an yeah, instant. For sure. I absolutely guarantee it. And then after the guitar solo, uh, yeah, Mike's back, and he's got this really juiced uh, organ solo. There's some really incredible lines in here because <laughs> this is just such a good sounding track. You can see like anyone would be inspired, and he really you know pulls out this uh, in really injected solo here. Uh, and then there's like a nice clean break and a segue back to the vamp, and then the organ you know jams out, and then you get nice some screaming horns to the end. So you're like, oh, okay. 
this is a really good opening uh with this big bam uh the second track is uh, uh matador by uh grant green the uh, great jazz guitarist uh and this is another uh, big band track and uh yeah if you knew this melody uh is is kind of a well-known tune but uh that the famous line in the tune when the horns play it and it really builds the tension it's like beep and it's like a great tune to have uh you know horns on and then um they you know the the main theme is uh played on sax and organ uh together here which is is really nice uh combination and then it's traded off into the whole ensemble uh you get some nice uh, intense sax solo and then the horns build the tension to the end there's another kind of uh really awesome uh, bluesy lick solo by Peter Bernstein and then and the horns come in with the uh, intro figure and a, and a huge blast to bring in the uh, organ solo and the organ solo here has got some really interesting intervals and it keeps that the tension is like kept really high with these like kind of ascending figures that he plays and uh, then you know the band comes in again he's so the we having this big band I mean, it keeps that that tension moving along and they trade phrases with the drums before it comes back in and then uh you know, kind of cool slow down to the end there's a few more like organ treats like tossed in there too so that's good and you know so now you started off with you know these two really jazzy tracks and then uh mike ladon does what he always does is he finds starts finding these uh tunes that you won't expect that he's going to uh mine yeah, basically here. pop tunes yeah yeah Mm. And uh, well, this one he's done before with the uh, 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 the quartet from ten years ago or so on his tune on his uh, album, The Groover. And this is uh, Michael Jackson's "Rock with You," and uh, and he sets this one off to like a real cruising groove with uh, horns and organ intro. Uh, it's a really nice treatment. You know, just makes you want to go out and take a drive somewhere. Mm. Uh, the organ takes the melody, and compared, you know, to the earlier recording of it now you've got these horns that are like really pushing it along i can see why he'd want to do this one again with big band because you know his arrangement of it was really cool uh nice sax solo and a jazzy guitar solo here and then uh you know uh, ladon comes in and he he has a really fun solo he ring he really rings it out he gets that you know kind of a high sustained chord and then soloing under that uh, you know, which is something you only hear on organ. You, know, you can't do this kind of thing on piano. It's, it's a different technique. Um, but that, you know, that's always a cool thing. You, you, know, you know, sometimes they cross their hands when they do this and then uh, yeah. uh, play that out. Uh, so that's really cool. And you go, get the theme again, and then some. Uh, you know, a little bit of more organ jamming. And you just like, like everyone's having fun, and you are too because you're listening to this tune. So uh, it's great. <laughs> you know, and then. You know, we're going back in time here. So, hey, why not? Uh, if we, if you call up, um, you can't call Michael Jackson anymore, but I think Lionel Richie is still around. Yeah. And so we get his old tune, uh, Still, you know, and, yeah. uh, you know, now, probably, did he, he originally performed this with the Commodores, Lionel Richie, or is this his this solo tune? Commodores tone? tune or solo He might one. be, uh, well, he wrote it. It I, could I have been like his last it. hit with the Commodores. I'm not sure. But, uh, I'm going to look that up while yeah, you talk. Here we check go. it out. But uh, yeah, this gets a nice treatment, uh, a really sexy sax melody uh, over these dark organ chords and some nice guitar fills. And then the sax solo turns up the heat. Um but uh, yeah, this is you got to listen to this one because this is. Um, well, Mike will talk about this in the interview uh, here. But uh, listen hey, to not how me, Michael Don. <laughs> yeah, Michael Don. Listen to yeah. how the organ solo starts. You know the you know the organ is such an interesting instrument with all of these uh, stops and different tonal possibilities. So listen to how it starts out uh, dark and mellow, and then you know you're going to be in a full gospel revival. Um, when uh this happens and then uh and then you'll get put back in the pews again when the uh, sax melody comes in uh i won't use you have to listen to the interview for the correct uh 
description. It's a noun that uh, he calls this uh, for what uh, this is. Uh, but you know, this is a great example of that organ technique. And we get, uh, I think it's a kind of a, a coda on this piece because the ending is uh, a, a different outro uh, to that. So uh, yeah, a real good interpretation of this old uh, song. Anyone who's an old timer like we are will remember it, uh, this <laughs> one. As we're becoming. Yeah. And yeah. then we get uh, Party Time by uh, Lee Morgan. Uh, it's a, a great uh, classic tune here. It's a kind of a loping minor swing uh, and um, acoustic bass line here. And then the organ comping sets the uh, groove. Uh, and then the organ joins, on, the guitar joins on that uh, kind of jagged melody in unison with the organ, which is really cool, adding the tones in there. The horns build in, and then uh, we get a nice uh, guitar and sax solo with those added horn stabs to feed everything along. Uh, here, the organ solo, get, you know, this is a really groovy, bluesy tune, so he, he takes it, you know, outside of, you know, that format with some outside uh, play in his solo, and... Uh, then he uh, explodes into some like trills and then you get the huge screams of John Faddis on trumpet adding to the climax of so this one really uh, builds up. And then uh, you go back to the theme and some more organ jamming to get to that final scream. And uh, number six is uh, another original tune, Bags and Brown. So kind of uh, thinking of two famous players here. Again, you can hear more about this one on the interview. Uh, this one starts with the whole band swinging uh, and then to some like, great kind of stop time organ alternating with the band. Uh, some nice guitar solos, tenor solos, and the horns push it along the last time around. And uh, there's a really nice uh, bluesy trill filled organ solo and it keeps uh, building helped by the uh, horn blasts. So it's a really nice original tune. And then uh, number seven, this was a big uh, surprise for me here. <laughs> for both uh, of us, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it brought for, us way back to high school. Way fact, back to 1980. From, from high school. Yeah. yeah uh, deep dive. Uh, uh, this is a huge uh, pop hit by the group Ambrosia, the biggest part of me. And, uh, you know, um, but uh, his interpretation of it uh, will make you thinking, wait, what is that tune, you know? Uh, and then, so he, it starts out with the kind of tenor sax over an organ vamp, and then the, the melody comes in, and, and then he makes it swing. And, uh, you know, of course, this is a pop tune. It didn't originally swing, but, uh, you know, now it does. <laughs> and uh, then there's a nice <laughs> little break into the first solo, and then another really swinging uh, guitar solo. And then... Um, then the organ solo is really grooving here, uh, some fast lines and bluesy riffs uh, before he comes back and hints at the melody again right before a drum solo. And then back to the sax and the melody and then trading some uh, phrases for the organ. So this is a really uh, you know, creative uh, arrangement and reworking of this tune so that it's like, you know, familiar enough to to uh, remind you but keep you guessing uh, and then made me go back and want to listen to the original and, you know bring me back to wherever I was at that time junior high school mm. or something terrible Boy. like that <laughs> yeah it was yeah. I guess I guess the yeah I don't know I remember hearing this on AM radio yeah, yeah it was ubiquitous yeah it was mm -hmm. everywhere and then uh, the album closes out with uh, an original uh, blues uh, blues for Jed and this is uh, just back to the, uh, well, by the way, the uh, previous tune, you know, the, the biggest part of me was uh, just the uh, Groover Quartet. Uh, the big band uh, is finished at track six, and so eight is also the quartet. This is, uh, the, the final tune is just an up-tempo uh, blues, uh, but what's nice here, it's almost eight minutes long, so, uh, you know, what they do is let everyone stretch out on their solos here, and uh, so... The uh, you know the blues melody here is on uh, doubled up on the tenor sax and organ, and then the exol the solos everyone's got a lot of room to stretch out, and uh, so they get a really nice burning tenor solo here, uh, and then uh, the accompaniment is uh, just as uh, nice to listen to as the solos. These are huge, well placed organ chords 
that support uh, the choruses. And then, you know, Peter Bernstein is just adding some kind of texture, subtlety, because you know, he's a really great, subtle guitarist here. But then uh, what I noticed on this one is, uh, you know, uh, Bernstein plays his usual, you know, super tasty guitar uh, uh, solo licks, but um, he... Uh, and he's got a, a lot of extra choruses and things to play here. So he p actually plays a chord solo, you know, which I've never heard him uh, do before on uh, any of his other, you know, recordings of his solo or with uh, Mike LaDon. So that was kind of cool uh, <laughs> to hear him do this because it sounds really uh, good. And, you know, it's it's nice to hear, you know, other than just, uh, you know, uh, solo lines on guitar to incorporate some chord things. So as we heard uh, last week, uh, what was it? Uh, LVL on uh, you know the, the uh, sort of Latin guitar kind of uh, uh, playing when players play so you know instead of just solo lines with some uh, you know strumming with chords too, and then uh, yeah and after the guitar we get another great organ solo that builds some f you know funky tension and he has a lot of space to stretch it out and uh, you know get those uh, kind of you know, Leslie kind of effects and things going on it and so you know this is just a fun tune to close out this album and let the quartet players all you know jam um, here yeah I was just thinking uh, in the interview also uh, Mike Mike Ladon talks about uh, the Leslie and it, we yeah. always say the Leslie the Leslie it's it's a speaker we, every, people right. need to know that just in case our listeners aren't too uh, instrument savvy it's the uh, Hammond B3 organ speaker and I, I believe it rotates is that right yeah that's that right a, yeah that's yeah. where you get mm -hmm. the uh, you know the, mm -hmm. the the kind of vib vibrating uh, tonal variances from it and it's such a cool thing you know because um, in uh, you know now we have synthesizers that can you know you know imitate very well, but not quite duplicate all these other yeah, sounds of warmth, organs and keyboards. Kinda. But um, you know, there's something about like um, you know uh, mechanical things that have a draw that are really nice. It's like yeah, you can have you can buy your Apple Watch, you know, and you know I have a, like this room is covered with computers and digital things, but you know, all my watches yeah. are mechanical. Why? Just because there's so much more cool and yeah, uh, they're, they're cooler know, yeah. they they mm -hmm. rely on this uh, perfected you know technology from an earlier time and you know the organ is you know it's a uh, instrument that uh, dates back you know uh, to religious music and churches and uh, you know it's it's a mechanical kind of thing that's capable of producing these really yeah. uh, soulful sounds that uh, you know in, they draw you in like they, they uh, back to baseball games too don't forget yeah baseball games too that's right yeah. uh, but you know we used to hear this back in the 60s and 70s on all kinds of you know pop songs and rock music and uh, soul jazz and things and uh, we've talked about a lot of uh, organ recordings uh, in jazz uh, on our show mm -hmm. but uh, yeah I don't think anyone I, you know, I really love the sound of the Hammond yeah. organ it's one of the things that drew me yeah. back to jazz because it was where it was being used yeah. Yeah. And I don't think anyone today really can pull as much out of it as Mike Ladon does, you know, here. And uh, he gets, like, all the effects. Uh, you know, he tries lots of, you know, different things uh, in this context. But, you know, his thing is, you know, it's always going to, you know, be very soulful and, you know, have that, uh, you know, rhythmic kind of swing uh, quality yeah. to it. And uh, and in here, it's just amplified with, you know, these super tasty uh, big band arrangements and the great players who add to it. So uh, the only thing, I, it's not a criticism, but uh, I would have liked to hear the album and, you know, with one more big band <laughs> tune because I got, I got so like really, you know, charged on the big band. I just wanted to hear it once more uh, yeah. before it went out, you know, but... Um, yeah, this is great. I hope that, um, you know, especially after uh, last year you had the uh, Christian McBride big band. Uh, that was Joey, a great record, the Wes and Oliver, right? Yeah, Wes yeah. and with, uh, you know, Oliver Nelson. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was great. And so, you know, if there's more like big band with organ, it it can only be like a good thing. <laughs> Because you know, yeah. uh, these are things you don't get. We haven't heard a lot in recent years, uh, and uh, but uh, yeah, f here for sure. This uh, this is a great uh, organ release, and it's another good big band album too. This is going to put you in a good mood, and yeah. you're going to want to know more about this uh, music. And uh, so definitely check out the 
interview special edition episode coming out on Friday. Absolutely. Uh, because, oh, by the way, the uh, the winner of the trivia question for tonight is uh, still is a Commodore song. It's a 1979 song. Okay. It was, it was released as a single, so it wasn't on an original album, although it appeared on their hit album, Midnight Magic. And uh, it is notable for being their last number one before Lionel Richie went solo. So there you oh, go. Okay. That sounds right. Yeah. yeah. I thought that I it thought was so, still because a I remember the song. song. Yeah. 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 That was before he, what was it? Hello. Is it Hello, me you're boy. looking for? Yeah. But he had, he had some, he had other songs. So he had Lady and Lady. Was that before Hello? Yeah. There were other ones no, too. Lady. Was that his song? Yeah, that was him. I don't know. Don't I'm make me sure. go back. That that, that uh, time was kind of uh, well, anyway, I don't. He yeah, had yeah. a lot of hit songs back in the yeah, day. Yeah, of course. I yeah. remember he appeared at uh, Live Aid too. He just kind of. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Everybody was expecting Michael Jackson. It was him, and we were all disappointed. Yeah. Because <laughs> you know you would think you you thought you were going to get this electrifying Michael Jackson appearance, but that didn't happen. It didn't happen. That's right. Well, okay. Just um, a reminder: we're going to be back next Monday, of course, with our next episode but we have a bon special bonus episode uh, midweek or really at the end of the week you can start your weekend with that uh the michael don interview that'll be up on friday morning if you're uh east of the atlantic and if you're in the americas it'll be um on thursday evening so That's look for right. it and if you're still with us i uh, want to remind you that you know in the episode description as usual you're going to find links to uh Spotify and Apple Music for all the music we'll discuss, yeah, with the exception the, of the Hyperion. Yes, uh, because they don't put their stuff up. I don't right. know. I, this might one of my favorite record labels too. I love all their yeah, artists. You know. Yeah. Well, we'll yeah. see what time uh, brings. Uh, and but also uh, there's at the uh, top of the link is a uh, another link, or I'm sorry, the top of the list. There's a link to all the music in one place on Deezer. And uh, you can also follow us there on uh, Adult Music Podcast. I usually get the links for all the music up early in the week, so you can actually check them out before we talk about them uh, on the podcast. And uh, if you can't see the full description on your list of your app, uh, just go to our host site on Podbean, and uh, you'll find everything easy to reach there in the description. And please, if you enjoy the podcast, uh, follow or subscribe on whatever app or platform you're listening to us on. That'll help Give us. Give us a rating, five stars, Give us a please. Rating, yeah, a ranking rating. Leave a comment. That'll help us grow the audience. Uh, and yeah, uh, especially the five star ranking will help us grow the audience a lot. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, so just take a few seconds. We'd really appreciate it. Or if you want to. Contact us directly if you have any comments or questions. Our email is adult music podcast, all one word, at gmail.com. And just for a further teaser, if you've made it this far, this uh, uh, interview coming out with uh, Mike Ladon will be uh, our first jazz interview, but we've already got one in the classical category for you. Something new coming out next month. And uh, you're going to want to know about this because it's music that everyone will be hearing for the first time. Yeah, that's always an exciting uh, yeah. uh, development. You'll, we'll find out. It's, it's music we've already talked about um, that's right. on the podcast, the uh, the Ranitsky Symphonies. So um, yeah. we'll be talking to the conductor and the... Um, the how would you say? <laughs> the researcher? How, we don't really know what... Uh, Maybe the... The foremost, <laughs> the foremost expert on the foremost expert, all Renitsky things expert. Renitsky. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's more of this music that's going to be coming out. And uh, we know when the next the next part is coming out. And right. you'll be able to hear right from the source of this recording yeah. uh, as soon as it does come out later next month. So yeah. uh, that's already set to go in the pipeline. So it's going to be an exciting month of things coming up. All right. And possibly more. We don't know yet. We, that's what we got so far, but more surprises are bound to more appear. More surprises are bound to come up. So mm. look for the Mike Ladon interview coming up this Friday and then uh, something else next month with more Renitsky music coming out. And uh, until next week then this has been episode 17 mm. of adult music the podcast with music for the mature mind and 
tune in on Friday for the interview. And then after that, we'll be back again next week with episode 18 and some more new releases for you. So have a good week and we'll see you next time.